seems like today there's a lot of talk about the scriptures and the Bible and how we use them uh, in the church for those of us that follow Jesus. So I thought I would spend some time today and talk uh, about something that I think is pretty controversial in a lot of circles, uh, and that is the authority of the Bible. We talk about the Bible uh, as the living Word of God. We also talk about Jesus as the living Word of God. Um, and I want to look today at how, uh, as Christians, as followers of Jesus, we can see that Jesus uh, is the one that who is that is revealed in the Scriptures, so that Jesus and the Scriptures uh, cannot be separated. Uh, oftentimes in our tradition, we call the Scriptures the only rule for faith and life. That is to say, it's the only uh, definitive and authoritative guidance that we have, both for our faith and for how we behave, how we live. Um, I think often many of us end up approaching the Scriptures uh, kind of like a treasure hunt. We'll say, oh, well, we know that God is in the Bible somewhere. We just have to look around uh, and figure out where he is. And conversely, by doing that, we say that God is not in part of the scriptures. And I think that can be very dangerous. Um, so today, I, I hope we can look at what it means for the Bible to be authoritative. Um, in, in the words of Paul uh, in 2 Timothy 3.16, that all of Scripture, every part of it, is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, and for correction, and for training in righteousness. So one important way uh, that I think we can talk about the authority of Scripture is by talking about um, how we understand the Bible as the living Word of God uh, and do that uh, by looking at how the Spirit of God uh, is present as we interact uh, with the scriptures and, and particularly as God's spirit has been and continues to be present uh, in the scriptures both in their writing and their formation and in our reading and interpretation of the scriptures. Uh, obviously this is not to say that Jesus is not the word of God but that Jesus and the scriptures can never be separated. If we start to come up with a Jesus uh, that is different from what we read in Scripture, uh, then we have come up with a new and different Jesus, uh, and not the one whom we call Savior and Lord. So as we start out today, I just want to acknowledge up front that for followers of Jesus, uh, believing in the Scriptures, following the Scriptures, is always and primarily an act of faith. Um, there's never going to be any definitive proof that we can have. Uh, this is one of the ways that God works in our lives uh, to give us faith and to encourage us. Is not um, just to give us something that we believe was dropped from heaven. Uh, we don't believe the Bible just uh, materialized from a cloud one day. Um, but that God's actually active and working uh, with, with God's people. Um, so today as we talk about the impact of the Bible... Uh, in terms of its authority over us and its guidance on us, uh, we'll look at that through the lens of the presence of the Holy Spirit. And uh, if we affirm the authority of the Scripture, then we can look at the power uh, of and the presence of God's Spirit uh, in three distinct ways. The first one is that the Spirit was present with the writers of Scripture as the different books of the Bible were written. Uh, so God is not a distant God. God is not a God who creates and then just leaves us uh, by ourselves to kind of run things by ourselves. Um, and it should be actually very encouraging to us as human beings that human beings wrote the Bible, wrote the scriptures, because it affirms this primary fact about Christian faith, that God is with and in the midst of his people. God dwells with his people. Um, I hope that this also lifts up the authority of the scripture instead of diminishing as it, it, as it sometimes seems. A lot of times you'll hear somebody say, well, the Bible was just written by men. And so therefore, parts of it clearly are not um, from God. But the contrast and what is really true is that God doesn't just send us a book from heaven. He doesn't just dictate into the ears of someone specifically what they are to write down. But instead, in the very writing of Scripture, God shows us who He is, a God that cares about people, that cares about us. And so, therefore, the Bible should speak to us in a more intimate and relational way. 
It's not a top-down God giving us a bunch of arbitrary laws to follow, but instead God speaking in the very presence of his people whom he loves and cares about. And so this ultimate expression of God's love is seen in the sending of his Son, which is for us and for our salvation, and this is what the scriptures primarily point to. So the first point, God's Spirit was present as the scriptures were written. Second, and this is one that is difficult and I think where most of the controversy lies, God's Spirit was also present as the people of God discerned what was God's Word. That is to say, God's Spirit didn't stop working when the Bible was collected, when the books of the Bible were put together and recognized as actually God's Word. Now, there are some voices, and they come uh, both inside and outside of the church, that like to point out that human beings in the church decided what books were in and what books were out of the Bible. This is made uh, very popular recently by the works of Dan Brown, um, particularly the Da Vinci Code and the other book, Angels and Demons. Um, now, it's certainly true that people in the church were the ones who were discerning what God's word was, but as people of faith, we should not be so quick or be fooled into thinking that it was simple, as simple as leaving certain books out that very well might be scripture. If we believe that God was present as the scriptures were written, then we must also believe that God was present as the scriptures of the book the books of the Bible were collected and recognized to be God's word to humankind. Bruce Metzger, who was a 20th century Bible scholar and who taught for many years at my alma mater, Princeton Seminary, um, and who also chaired the translation committees of both the uh, revised standard version and the new revised standard version of the Bible, um, has identified three important criteria that he says were implicitly working as the church was recognizing, discerning what books were God's word. Um, and, they, and then eventually were included in what we would call the New Testament uh, today. I find these very helpful in understanding uh, how the Bible has come to be as it is today. What it is with the, the 27 books of the New Testament that we call scripture, uh, how that happened. Uh, and this is not to say that the books of the Old Testament um, are not also scripture, uh, but the process by which they were recognized as scripture was a, an, another long process um, that was pretty much completed and understood by the time that Jesus was there. Often called in the Hebrew tradition, uh, the law the writings and the prophets and this has been this would be what Jesus was working with and referring to as scripture and those were already recognized um, so I want to focus on uh, how we got the 27 books of the New Testament these were the three criteria that Dr. Metzger says were implicitly working there there wasn't a list that they said this is the checklist that things have to fit into this but as God's spirit was moving these things were working uh, in the church the first one is apostolic association. That is to say that each one of these books that gets included in the New Testament in some way or another primarily has some sort of association with an apostle. So you think about uh, Mark, uh, the Gospel of Mark or the Gospel of Luke. Obviously Mark and Luke are not apostles, uh, but they both spend significant time with the apostles, particularly Paul who was recognized very early on by the church uh, as one of one of Christ's apostles, uh, even though he wasn't one of the original um, twelve. And so, as the books are collected and recognized as God's word um, by the people of God, by the church, um, one of the main things that's going on is is how does this book connect to the eyewitnesses of Jesus? How do these books reflect? Um, the, those folks who were with Jesus, who spent the most time with him, and then who have been able to pass the faith along to us from that point. So that's the first one, apostolic association. The second thing is that um, books being accepted as part of God's word in the New Testament uh, would not contradict books that had previously been accepted. Um, primarily that would mean books that would not contradict uh, the writings of Paul. Paul. 
Now, it may come as a surprise that the earliest books in the New Testament are some of Paul's letters. Uh, I like to think 1 Thessalonians is one of the earliest books. And you hear Paul talking in a way um, that is much more urgent uh, than, than maybe some of his later letters uh, in that book. There have been another, a few other arguments for different books as well, but, um, but mostly Paul's epistles. The Gospels are actually written a little bit later. Uh, many of Paul's works are dated in the uh, the 50s, uh, A.D. 50s. Um, Jesus, of course, would have been crucified around A.D. 30. Uh, so you have a very small gap of time, especially as far as ancient literature goes, um, that things are beginning to be recorded about uh, Jesus. For instance, um, the biography of Julius Caesar, which is widely accepted, was written about 150 years after his life. Um, but we don't uh, question its authenticity. Uh, the, the books of the New Testament were written in a much shorter uh, time span from when Jesus lived and died and was raised from the dead uh, than anything else uh, in, in comparable ancient history. Um, so the second thing is that the books are not contradicting those earliest works that are being used by the church and recognized as faithful witnesses uh, to Jesus and to what he was and what he looked like uh, in his life and his death and resurrection. Um, the last thing, the last one of these criteria that Dr. Metzger identifies is wide usage. That is to say that these books of the Bible, uh, as the church is discerning what will be the New Testament, what will be for us today the definitive um, Word of God, uh, were um, being used throughout uh, primarily the Roman Empire where Christianity has started to take root in the early centuries. Um, the, it's true that the very first complete list of all 27 books of the New Testament uh, is not found. We have no earlier copies of that before 364 with Athanasius. Now, at first, uh, when, when I first mentioned that, it probably sounds a little scary. Uh, there's over 300 years before we have a list of all these books together in one place? Uh, and the answer is yes, um, for a couple of reasons. One is it would have been very dangerous before around 300 uh, or 325 in particular when Constantine the Emperor makes Christianity a legal religion of Rome. It's not made the official religion of Rome until later on in 381 under Theodosius. Um, but Emperor Constantine says something that's not been said before, and that is, Christianity is legal. You can practice it without fear of repercussions from the Roman government. And so, as late as the 290s, there had been severe persecutions of people who were following Jesus, early Christians. Uh, and so to be caught with, with an entire list of all of the books that are important to you and to your faith, uh, what we would now call the New Testament would be a very dangerous endeavor and something that the early church would have been very careful about. That's one reason for how long uh, it would have taken to find this. The other is there might just have been these lists that we've not discovered yet. Um, that no one was uh, necessarily as careful as we are today about maintaining. Um, another thing is it does, in fact, take the early church and the other followers of Jesus some time to discern what is God's word. Uh, again, this is because of how God works with humanity, and you see it throughout the scriptures themselves and in our experience. Uh, as Presbyterians, we believe that we discern the will of God in community. We do that together. And to put too much power in one person's hand for the church to have appointed one particular person to decide or even one council to say these books are in, these books are out, would not have been a faithful way of coming to consensus about what God's word was. Uh, and so that would have taken some time, uh, and that was time that was not necessarily available to them when they were worried about persecution, worried about being arrested, worrying about being fed to lions or had uh, limbs torn off, which was a reality for early followers of Jesus. Um, so also in terms of the Spirit being present as the people of God discerned what the new uh, particularly the New Testament would be, uh, which I think is where most of the controversy lies. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about some of the books that were left out. Um, this last criteria, wide usage, is one of the things that does end up uh, being a determination for some books. There's a book called The Shepherd of Hermas, uh, which is very uh, orthodox, doesn't contradict things. Um, Apostolic Association is not uh, so certain about that book, but the reality of the book of Hermas was that it was only used in one particular part 
uh, were the church of the church. So it was only used uh, in one place and was not being widely uh, read and widely copied and disseminated throughout um, primarily, again, the Roman Empire where Christianity originally had been taking root. Um, usually today, though, when people talk about the left out books of the Bible or what's often been called the lost Gospels, if you've heard this phrase before, they are particularly referring to what are known as the Gnostic Gospels. Now, Gnosticism was a particular sect uh, that was around uh, at the time of Jesus and afterwards into the time of the early church. Um, Gnostic, the word gnosis in Greek, uh, is just the word knowledge. And so the central tenet of this sect, Gnosticism, which had been around before Christ and then had tried to employ uh, some of Christ's teaching uh, to fit into their philosophical understanding, um, the central tenet of their sect was that God had to give you secret knowledge, secret gnosis. Um, and only the people who received this central knowledge from God, this kind of secret key to unlocking the realities of God and of uh, life, were really included in God's plan. Um, now, if that sounds very exclusive to you, it should. Uh, it was very, very different from the early church. You read again and again radical ideas uh, in the New Testament, in the early church, of including all people. And people from many different um, uh, backgrounds in life are drawn to the gospel, respond to the gospel. It includes the rich, the poor, the slave, the free. Uh, and this is something that, that the writers of the gospels in the New Testament are saying, this gospel, this good news of Jesus, is available to everyone. And so to say that you needed a secret knowledge was contrary to the very foundation of the gospel itself. Uh, the other thing that's interesting about these particular writings that come out of the sect uh, of Gnosticism, the Gnostic Gospels, you might have heard of them, the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, the Gospel of Judas. These are the, some, some of the ones that um, have not really been lost. They, we've always had them. They just kind of go through periods of popularity throughout history. And we're in one of those periods now where they're being rediscovered and studied um, to tell us about, uh, particularly about life um, in that time, and also um, sometimes about the church and what it looked like and sometimes what it didn't look like. Um, now, the earliest that any of these books has been dated that I've ever read is 150 AD, um, which is very early. Uh, many scholars believe these are books that are written uh, into the 200s, into the 3rd century. Um, these Gnostic Gospels, the so-called left-out books uh, of the Bible. Um, the latest anything in the New Testament that we would include and say is part of uh, the Bible, of the Scriptures that God intends for us, um, the latest any of those has been dated is 120. That would be the book of Revelation, John's Revelation. Um, and again, that seems to be very late. Many other scholars and arguments that I've read uh, indicate that that book was probably written uh, closer to 90 uh, A.D., and that's what I uh, tend to think uh, is most accurate. Um, so there's a bit of gap here between the New Testament, what we call the New Testament, what the church has always claimed um, uh, to be uh, authoritative scripture and these Gnostic Gospels. But, but more important than that uh, is what many of us never do, and that is read any of these so-called left-out books. Um, and I want to read you one passage uh, from the Gospel of Thomas, which is one of the Gnostic Gospels. Um, and this highlights to me why this uh, is not God's Word, and I think that will become very clear. Um, now this, uh, most of the Gnostic Gospels are not written in narrative form uh, like the Gospels of the New Testament are to tell the stories and the story of Jesus, but they're written more as sayings or particular encounters and instances of Jesus. And so this one in the Gospel of Thomas, which does not by any means um, necessarily um, define uh, all of the Gnostic Gospels, some of the Gnostic Gospels seem uh, very good, but, but this is a good example of why the church would have discerned that this particular work, the Gospel of Thomas, is not, in fact, God's Word. This is saying number 114 from the Gospel of Thomas. Simon Peter said to him, to Jesus, Let Mary leave us, for women are not worthy of life. Jesus said, I myself shall lead her in order to make her male so that she too may become a living spirit resembling you males. For every woman who will make herself male will enter the kingdom of heaven. And the question 
before us is just as simple as it was for the early church as they discern what books were part of the scriptures and that is simply is this something that is consistent with the gospel that has been passed on to us that Jesus would be promising to transform females into males just so they can be saved the answer is a definitive no that the gospel is for men and women as well and so I, I want us to have some knowledge a little bit of knowledge can be dangerous to know that there are Gnostic Gospels uh, to know that the church was discerning what was God's word and what was not and then to take that a step further and say the church left some things out is dangerous if we don't actually study what those works are and so as followers of Jesus we have to continue to maintain that if God's Spirit was at work as the scriptures themselves were written then they were still then God's Spirit was still at work God didn't stop working God didn't stop being present with his people as those books were put together uh, in what we call the New Testament today and finally the third way I want us to talk about um, the Spirit uh, and the Spirit's presence uh, in terms of the Scriptures, especially in terms of the Scriptures as the living Word of God, is how God's Spirit is still present with us today as we read and interpret the Scriptures. Now, it is possible to believe that God and God's work does not change while maintaining that God continues to speak to us through His Word. Uh, how often have you heard one of, uh, even one of the faithful say um, that now, that especially one of the faithful say that no matter how many times they've read a particular part of Scripture, it still speaks to them, and it speaks to them in new ways. I think this is true for many of us who follow Jesus. We have fresh insight each time we sit down with God's Word open before us to study it. And so, for the Bible to be living and active in our lives, we have to read it. And we have to trust that God's Spirit is with us as we do that. Now this is also not to say that we will never encounter parts of the Bible that are challenging to us or even counterintuitive to us. If you're never challenged by God's Word or you never struggle with parts of it or you never find yourself uncertain about what something means, then you should keep reading. There is always a sacred tension for us as human beings because we are naturally prone to rebel against God, to sin. We are also not ourselves God, no matter how much we want to be God, no matter how much we try to keep control of our lives and the lives around us. Our experience shows us over and over again that we're not God. And so we live with this tension between our fallenness and between our seeking, our desire to understand God, to know God, to understand Scripture, and to submit to Scripture by following what the Scriptures teach. Now, I often like to talk about this tension in terms of the inextricable connection between the Scriptures and Jesus Himself. I think we all like to make up our own Jesus. Uh, this was made very popular a uh, uh, hundred years ago or so uh, with a, a very popular thing of, in academia called the quest for the historical Jesus. So people would set out, uh, usually with good intentions, to write a historical biography of Jesus to find out what parts were true and what parts weren't about Jesus. Um, and um, Albert Schweitzer uh, wrote a definitive work that showed that each time someone set out to do this, the Jesus they ended up with looked a lot like them looked like who they were, the culture they came out with, the values that culture had, um, and was simply a creation of a new Jesus, a different Jesus. And we all do this. We all have moments uh, in our lives where we like to think that Jesus thinks exactly like we are. He condones uh, certain actions that we may or may not be um, certain or what God's will uh, is for us um, but we shape and we morph Jesus until we get our own Jesus uh, and the 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 word for this in classic um, Christian faith and theology is simply idolatry it's a word in the Bible we're all prone to it you see over and over again God's people creating idols we're just a little more sophisticated perhaps in how we do that we don't set up a stone statue but we make our career or money or our family or any number of things an idol that we're able to worship. We can even make ourselves um, idols. And so um, 
one of the ways that we justify this in terms of creating our own Jesus is saying that Jesus is the living word of God and the Bible isn't. So we have to obey Jesus, but the Bible is only helpful insofar as it tells us um, truth about Jesus, uh, which implies that some of the Bible is clearly not truth uh, about God and about Jesus, which is a very dangerous and slippery slope. And the reality uh, is actually that we only know Jesus through the way that God has chosen to reveal Jesus to us which is the scriptures. And so we cannot ever separate Jesus and the scriptures. And so the Christian life is so much about seeking after God's word, reading God's word, struggling with it. There are always parts of it that will remain a mystery to us. There are always parts that we will struggle to interpret. But when we start to assume that we can say, this part is scripture, but this part probably isn't because it doesn't fit in uh, with who I think God is, then the odds are we've created our own God. And the Christian life for us is about resubmitting ourselves, going through that difficult purification process. Uh, the scriptures talk about uh, people being refined just as gold is refined and the the dross is burned off from the gold. All of the impurities, the infirmities uh, in the gold is burned away. And sometimes that process for us in becoming more like Jesus himself and becoming more holy as God calls us to be uh, is a difficult process and a struggle for us. But it's important for us to remain committed to it. So my hope is that uh, this has been some helpful background information that you may or may not have heard uh, or read before. Um, there's a lot of scholarship outs on uh, the scriptures and how they were collected, and I would uh, encourage you to look at that. Um, and, and again, as people of faith, I would encourage you um, that faith is always a part of belief. That belief and faith is the same word in Greek. And so for us to put our trust in God and to put our trust in God's word as, as an authentic and a reliable source of God's truth for us is something that will always take faith, but that God's spirit is with us as we do it, even as God's spirit was with those men and women uh, who were part of the writing of the scriptures, who were part of the collecting of the scriptures, uh, and those men and women who have passed the faith along to us. So friends, be encouraged today uh, to, to deeper commitments and resolve to read and understand and study and follow and submit yourself to the scriptures uh, because God's blessing awaits. May God be with you in that endeavor and may God be with each of us uh, in these times as we seek to, to follow him and to continue to uh, declare and proclaim the love of God in Jesus to all the world. Amen.